So it is a privilege to be here together today and to celebrate uh, what the Lord has done for us and that we can celebrate Jesus uh, this day. And so let us start off our service by reading from Matthew 1. Matthew 1 from verse 20. So it speaks about Joseph, where we find him in the story. It says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said to him, Do not be afraid to take Mary and your wife. For the child of the Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill, to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so it's wonderful that we can celebrate. We can celebrate that Jesus became man. He became man in the flesh. And that is why we are here today. Uh, and so let us just start the service of prayer. Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you that we can come here together on Christmas morning and celebrate what it is that you have done for us. That you became man. You walk this world with us and you experience life's challenges. You know what it is that we are going through. You're laid with each and every one of us. And so far we can celebrate that this morning and celebrate the miracle of the birth of Jesus Christ. And so far as we remember this this morning, I pray that you would, would fill our hearts with love, would help us to understand how you love us, and would experience your grace, your mercy, and your presence in just a new and a fresh way in today's service. And so, Father, we glorify everything that we do here today. And so we come before you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go to the worship.
We like this image. We like it so much we put it on all our Christmas cards, and we hang it around our houses, and when we close our eyes, that's what we picture. But there's a problem here. Well, at least I think so. Some of these things are in Scripture. So let's look at Luke's um, nativity in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. It was going to be very funny. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. A census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, no, no, to Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. The census is the first thing we're told about as Luke begins to tell us of Jesus' birth. The census has been a challenge for historians and theologians alike, but it's not actually that easy to confirm with other sources. However, thinking about the census in, the, in this context and why it was important for Luke to mention it, I think it's helpful to give us a bigger picture. We know this today that Jesus wasn't just a boy born into a simple family, but the census reminds us that he was born into a global world, into an empire with vast reaching arms um, that covered a huge amount of the world at the time. Second, it shows a contrast between the wealthy and powerful Caesar Augustus and Quirinius and everyone who was subordinate to them. Joseph and the heavily pregnant Mary had to travel some 145 kilometers to go to be counted. Why? Because the rich and powerful told them they had to. And this wouldn't have been a census that took place on one day. It may have taken <coughs> of over a year to complete. So Mary and Joseph would have carefully calculated their journey and gone when conditions were right. And I hope, even though scripture doesn't tell us, she travelled by donkey. I tell you why I hope that, because it's a beautiful symmetry if they did. Because the journey would have taken four days to a week, depending on how fast they were able to travel, um, which probably wouldn't have been very fast at her stage of pregnancy, and would have been sensible to have some sort of assistance with a donkey or a bike. And if she travelled by donkey, she would have travelled through Jerusalem on her way to Bethlehem. Jesus would have travelled by donkey in his mother's womb into Jerusalem from the east at the beginning of his life, and then on Palm Sunday, he repeated that journey from the east into Jerusalem. I've got a map to show you. It wouldn't have been a short or simple journey. The thing about this census that was different from all the other censuses is that it was a universal census. The previous census in the Roman Empire had focused on counting eligible men to be drafted into military service. Because of that, the Jewish people were not <coughs> counted because they were exempt from serving in the Roman army. But in this census, everyone was counted. And why? Because they wanted to know how much tax they could get. This census is therefore a symbol for the Jewish people of Roman oppression. So with Luke opens to us the story of the birth of a long-awaited Messiah. He is reminding both his readers and us today why the Jewish people needed such a saviour. So Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem. But there's a problem. Rather than the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the Saviour, the Messiah, to be born in a palace suitable for a person of such office, there didn't even appear to be a room available for them. In many traditions, the end of verse 7 is translated that she gave birth to a firstborn son, wrapped him in cloth, placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. But did you notice what Luke's account doesn't say? It doesn't mention the word stable. I'm sorry about that. 
We get this assumption because the fact is we are told that the inn was full and Mary laid Jesus in a manger. A manger, of course, a place where animals' food is placed. Therefore, animal stable. It's a sensible assumption, um, and in some traditions, um, they even believe that Jesus was born in a cave. There is a problem with this assumption, and the first is the translation itself. I'm going to get slightly geeky here, but I was forced to go to college and study Greek, so bear with me. When I read Luke 2, 1 to 7, I read it from the NIV, which, which translates it slightly differently. It says, she laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. Instead of in, it's translated as guest room. I like this translation a bit more because the word that Jesus, that Luke uses is cataluma, which is more often translated as a small room at the side of a family house, or a small room built on the roof of the house for guests. This is the same word that Luke uses when he described the upper room which Jesus and the disciples had the last supper together. But when Luke does describe an inn for travellers, in, in, in chapter 10, when we have the story of the Good Samaritan, he uses a different word. He uses the word pandocheon, um, which is more likely travel, translated as a, place, a public inn. So Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem and they go to a family house and they are told, we don't have a guest room for you. Just pause with me for a moment. This afternoon you go home, your family's gathered and a knock on the door happens and a relative and his heavily pregnant wife come to you and say, can we stay? And you say, no, we've got no room. We've got no guest room for you. What are your options? What might you say to Joseph and Mary? Because I'm pretty sure sending them back out into the cold or asking them to sleep in an outbuilding with animals may be quite low on your list. One of the things we need to do is understand what the houses were like at this time. The fact is they wouldn't have necessarily been a separate building for animals or separate bedrooms for the family members. Homes are likely to have been a single room where the whole family stayed and in some houses there may have been a small room for the guests. Inside the house there may have been an area sectioned off for animals, which could have been a slightly lower level or just a, a fenced off area in the main room. Animals would have been brought in for two reasons. One, because they provided warmth, and two, because it was safer for them to be inside at night. Either way, a house like this would have had mangers in the main living space because these animals needed feeding and looking after. We can see the evidence of one-room houses in other parts of the Gospel. In Matthew 5, we are told that people do not light a lamp and put it under a bowl, but instead put it on a stand to give light to everyone in the house. Now that's a lovely saying, we've heard it lots of times, but if you think about the architecture of the house when you listen to this, it only makes sense if there's a single room. You can't take a single lamp, put it on a stand, and assume it gives light to everyone if they're in multiple rooms. It only works if they're in one room together. We also see this. My, my, my notes keep disappearing. Enjoy it. Um, we also see this um, on Luke's account of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. When Jesus says to um, the people gathered, Do you not be on the Sabbath, untie your animals, and lead them out to water? We could argue where that out might be. One early scriptural translation <coughs> says out from the house. Bear with me. I got too excited for that wrong button. Can you tell them how to practice? None of his, none of the people that heard him that day said no, because they would have all very happily taken the animals out of their house. Because I don't know about you, but my house is crazy enough in the daytime without animals in it. I'm very happy to take the, you know, the animals out. So a family house may have looked a little bit more like this. Some place for the animals, which we might call a stable, 
with some mangers, a small recess in the floor, or a, or a built box with straw or hay in the family living area, and maybe a guest room, a cafe on the side. So it's my belief, reading the scripture in this way, that Mary and Joseph were not sent out to a separate place from the family. They were most likely just invited into the main space. As crowded as it may have been, um, it would have probably been helpful for Mary to have a few female relatives to help her in her labour. I wasn't the most use when either of our girls were born. I'm not sure that Mary and Joseph were outside the stable would have been Mary's first choice. In the opening of John's Gospel that we heard today, we get the beautiful poetry about the Word coming into the world. And in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among them. This was one of the first verses we had to translate in my Greek classes at college. And I had great joy to find out the literal translation of the word dwelt was tabernacle. That Jesus tabernacled amongst them. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst them. A really strong and powerful image for the Jewish readers. The message paraphrasing this verse is also done. It says Jesus moved into the neighborhood. The image of Jesus born in a family home amidst the noise and the commotion of a family with multiple guests staying, animals overnighting, and shows us a God who became like us. Not born separate, either in a palace or an outbuilding, but born in the midst of a family, literally a God with us, not a God near us. When he was born in the family home, cloths were given and he was wrapped and taken care of. He was loved and placed in a place of safety, in a manger, a recess with straw. In the UK, it wasn't that long ago that we, did, we put babies in the bottom drawer of a, of a chest of drawers to keep them safe and stop them rolling in the way. I think this would have been a normal scene repeated in many homes at the time. Jesus was immediately part of normal life, normal routines, normal noise, normal family. Because of that, for me, at least, it's easier to imagine him joining me in the chaos and the noise of my everyday life. Not needing to take myself off to some luxury denying place for the world, or even having a carefully prepared place in which I go to meet Jesus. No, he is truly Emmanuel, God with us. For Luke, Jesus isn't pictured as born over there, away from everyday life, inviting us to come and visit every now and again but at the heart of the home, asking whether we too will make a space for him. He is pictured as poor or outcast, not here at least, asking what we can do for him. But he comes as a child, a child of hope, a child of promise, asking what we, he might do for us. He is invited in, he is pictured as rejected, inviting us to pity him. He is pictured us as welcomed and a member of a family and asking whether we will welcome him too. So just as over 2,000 years ago, Jesus burst onto the scene and came right into the centre of our lives. We need him to do the same for us again. The idea is picked up in one of the best known camels, a little town of Bethlehem, which ends with this verse. I won't say that will be a Christmas present for me. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sins and enter in. Be born in us today. The real wonder of Christmas isn't our traditions or glittering lights or decorations. It isn't, it, isn't, it isn't just the fact that Jesus, Son of God, took on human form and was born in Bethlehem. No, the real wonder is that He can be born in us today. He can dwell in us and we can dwell in Him. He can bring us healing, His peace his purpose and his forgiveness into our lives. If, just as they did in Bethlehem, we make space for him and welcome him in our lives. Not a separate part of our lives, reserved just for him, but we need to invite him right into the centre of our everyday life, where he can be involved in each and every part of it. Into the noise moments and the quiet ones, into the peaceful moments and the chaotic ones, into our highs and our lows into each and every part of our life. When we gathered around the communion table today, we remember Jesus' birth and life and death. 
Through Jesus, we are offered a place in community in a family. It wasn't until Jesus came into the world that we began to understand God as Father. Through his death and resurrection, he restores our connection with our Heavenly Father. This is what we remember at the table. Jesus is inviting us on a journey to continue to discover him, to find our place in his family and install his place in our own. He doesn't want us to be lonely or isolated. He doesn't want us to be sad or afraid. He wants to bring us into relationship with him and with each other and with the Father. So this Christmas time, remember that Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, who lives just like us, born into a home and into a family. He experienced love and pain. He experienced community and rejection. Just like all of us do from time to time. He knows what we have experienced because he became like us. So this Christmas, let us enjoy our traditions. Let us firmly make sure Jesus is at the centre of the war, this day and always. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to pray a blessing on us all. Um, and after that, let's just say, please do join us outside for refreshments. I hope you have an amazing Christmas, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. So let me play, pray this blessing. May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, and the obedience of Mary and Joseph, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And may each know the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day and always. Amen. Just to look to you each and every day, remembering just how 
great you are, how awesome you are, how good you've been to us, remembering your grace, your mercy, your love. And so we, may we hold on to that each day of our lives. So be glorified in this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so with that, I invite you to please participate with us.
Sing.